The Unshackled Waves, episode 98. Broadcasting from Melbourne, Australia, this is The Unshackled Waves with Tim Wills. Brought to you by theunshackled.net. Hello everyone, great to have you company. We've got another interview show for you today. Another alt media figure we met at Liberty Fest was Facebook vlogger Libby Down Under, who publishes posts, memes and videos on contemporary political issues in Australia. She is a fierce critic of political correctness and cultural Marxism, and is a contributor to Liberty Works, both in print and on their vodcast. We thought we'd invite her on today to discuss her vlogging, her views, as well as look at some of the current hot political topics. Libby, welcome to the show. Great to be on the show. Now, your Facebook page, uh, Libby Down Under, is uh, very active. Uh, You use a combination Mm -hmm. of uh, personal uh, videos, uh, sharing news, uh, which co- covers your opinion on it, and also uh, plenty of uh, memes, which, which of course, are very effective in the uh, internet age. Uh, mm-hmm. Why did you decide to become active on social media, and what's your goal? So there would be, I guess this is for many people as well, there'd be many reasons if we could stick to the main ones. I guess... There's a narrative out there that's written by the cultural Marxists that um, because I'm a non-Anglo-Celtic transgender woman, um, there's a narrative written for me uh, from uh, the cultural Marxists that um, politically I'm meant to lean left, I'm meant to support safe schools, I'm meant to um, infringe on or support infringing on the uh, right to free speech of others, that are allegedly homophobic, transphobic, racist, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, um, bisphobic, um, uh, badism, um, and it got to the point where um, uh, you know I we live in a we live in a Western society where the stigma against someone who is non-Anglo Celtic, someone who's a woman, someone who's transgender, um, a lot of that stigma's gone for the most part. But now it's kind of replaced with, um, for example, on transgenderism, the normalisation of trans, uh, transgenderism, um, even though, it, uh, in my view, it's by and large a medical condition that shouldn't be normalised. And I just got fed up with the lefties, the culture Marxists, the political correctness brigade trying to speak on my behalf when, in fact, they don't speak on my behalf. It sounds like a lot of us are quite similar why we decided to enter this field of alternative media. We just got, you know, uh, so sick of just getting, you know, angry ourselves that, you know, we needed to, you know, share our message and help, you know, spread it to, to other people that, you know, A, you know, they're not alone with, you know, their concerns about, um, you know, these cultural issues and clamp down on our, our freedoms, but also to, uh, you know, really, you know, fight, you know, identity politics and say, you know, People, you know, aren't aren't all the same. You know, everyone's uh, uh, an individual, which uh, I, I think it's been a really important um, uh, c- counter to uh, what's what's been going on in the mainstream media. And as for myself, uh, on that note, I, I guess in a way, I'd like to show uh, the wider world out there that um, not every non-Anglo Celtic trans women out there, um, not every trans woman out there uh, is open, you know, is in full full, um, agreement with the cultural Marxist narrative. I strongly disagree with that narrative. It's not a reflection of me, it's not a reflection of my experience, it's not a reflection of my political views. And as you rightly pointed out, uh, at the end of the day, you know, it's quite harmful to group people as, oh, you know, you're the gays and therefore, you know, you need to behave in a particular way, you need to have particular views, or you're transgender and um, therefore you're a victim and follow this narrative. I guess uh, in a way I want to show that, no, that's not true. You don't ha- I don't need to follow 
um, for cultural mar Marxist narrative. And neither does everyone else. We're all individuals with our own individual views. And I guess I want to put out there what my politics are, what my political views are, um, and not be afraid to do that. Uh, what have you found with the, the content that you've posted? Uh, what issues do you f feel resonate with uh, the people that follow your page? Um, of late, I find that um, recently I did two um, video blogs on touching on the topics of uh, gender, uh, gender politics, um, gender and sex in classrooms, safe schools. And for from what I gather from the comments, um, their politics, you know, just in general interaction with um, a lot of these folks on uh, my Facebook page of late, um, a lot of them are on the, they're supporting, they're supporters for no side of the um, same-sex marriage survey. They, um, they oppose the Trojan horse, uh, that's um, the luggage, uh, the baggage that comes with the Yes campaign, and that also includes safe schools. They may not necessarily, you know, agree with um, gay rights or trans rights or um, whatever, you, you know, whatever um, rights that may be, and they may not necessarily agree with my circumstance, personal circumstances, but um, I think what resonates for a lot of these, uh, uh, you know, the new audience of late on my Facebook page is we can agree to disagree, we can engage in respectful debate, and that's very important. And we haven't really seen respectful debate from the Yes campaign and those on the Yes side supporting uh, safe schools and um, the gender politics of the um, cultural Marxist uh, angle of uh, sex and gender that's been put out there. Um, I, I think if people don't agree with any of that stuff, by all means disagree with it, and I don't think there should be any consequences of it. So uh, I feel that's the audience, the, the new audience that's been coming on my page of late, and I think that resonates with them, whether they agree with my personal circumstances or not. Uh, do you come from a political background? Have you been politically active in the past or is this a new uh, foray for you? Not really a new foray. I've been politically active since I was 15. I, when I was a 15 year old, I joined the Labour Party and I got involved in Young Labour. Um, that lasted for a few years um, into the early days of uh, uni. Um, being active in the Labour Party didn't really work out. I mean, you know what the Labour machine is like. Um, I, I was hoping to, I, I, I guess I was one of these la aspiring Labour hacks trying to um, build something um, from joining the Labour Party and that didn't work out. And that doesn't work out for a lot of young Labour hacks, um, at least back in my time. It may have gone worse um, since then. Um, but I, you know, during my uni days and thereafter for a little bit, I was involved, you know, I was in and out of the Labour Party. I was a member of the Greens for a little bit. Thankfully, I wasn't part of the Greens for very long. Um, and then I, for a period, um, 2012 till, I suppose, 2015, early 2016, I wasn't too politically involved, politically active. Um, you know, I, I was disillusioned and I, I guess I could only hold the fire within me, the passion within me for so long. I was close to joining the Liberal Party um, sometime after uh, Malcolm Turnbull became Prime Minister. I had a bad feeling about that, so I joined the Liberal Democrats um, instead. Um, I joined them around the 2016 election um, and yeah, that's been, uh, I'm currently, I joined the, the Australian Conservatives um, about a month or two ago. Um, 
I identify as a conservative libertarian at present. Now, one of the issues both of us are concerned about is the rise of uh, cultural Marxism, which uh, what I see it as is obviously the uh, left, they've realised that economic Marxism has failed with the collapse of the Soviet Union and fall of the, the Berlin Wall. So now they're attacking our, our cultural institution. Now, the, the left, they try to um, claim that this term cultural Marxism, it's a made up term, that it's uh, a dog whistle to uh, conservatives for, you know, saying that you shouldn't like, uh, you know, these uh, certain things. How do you define um, cultural Marxism and why do you think it's such a threat? Well, I think we should start with, you know, what is Marxism in its classical sense? So, um, I mean, it's, you could Google it. It's classical Marxism. It's um, dictatorship, dictatorship by the proletariat. Um, and, you know, associate definitions to go about. So, um, cultural Marxism, therefore, it's, you take all the economics out and, um, you know, you get cultural Marxism. So, I mean, how would I define it? It would be um, attempts to eradicate, um, I, I believe it's ultimately an attempt to eradicate Western culture so I suppose from the culture Marxist point of view, um, uh, the, um, I suppose Western institutions, um, liberal democratic institutions that have held the foundations of Western civilization very well for a very long time and we know it works. Um, I suppose from the culture Marxists, from their point of view, um, all that great stuff that makes Western civilization great that's the uh, bourgeoisie and the proletariat is supposedly um, anyone who is socially discriminated, uh, disadvantaged, so um, uh, non anglo celtic people, women, um, gays and lesbians, transgender people. From the cultural Marxist point of view, I believe they would see them as the proletariat, the working class, so to speak, that uh, needs to overthrow the bourgeois um, Western institutions that's held us together very well for a very long time. That's how I would define it. And, and certainly something that, that I noticed uh, over the, the past couple of years that started, uh, in my opinion, on the Ameri American college campuses where we were told that, you know, apparently, you know, we hadn't, you know, reached this, um, you know, point in, you know, our society where, um, you know, everyone just judged each other as, you know, individuals. We'd, you know, gotten rid of the, um, you know, bigotry of the past. We were told all of a sudden, apparently, that no society as we know it was, you know, all built on, you know, racism, sexism, uh, you know, homophobia, and we basically need to needed to deconstruct all of our society because it was all part of this uh, oppression and th that's what really w w woke me up it's like well these people are saying that pretty much the society that I've grown up with you know I've grown up with you know people of you know different races you know uh, sexualities and obviously you know got along with people of you know the the op opposite gender like all of a sudden you're saying that no this is th th this is all uh, oppression and I mean that, that that's a uh, pretty you know dangerous thing to say that you know we need to you know tear it all down and and start again which is what you know marxism was that you know the 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 bourgeoisie the capitalist society was bad and we needed to you know start 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 all again and of course when you when you do that and as we've seen with um you know socialist and communist societies of the 20th century i mean it just causes you know a division hostilities people you know don't trust each other uh, and this uh, flows on to you know the uh, the other uh, parts of the uh, or flow on from cultural marxism which is you know identity politics where you know for example you and me aren't you know aren't allowed to simply like get along like I, I have to consider you, you know, completely different just because, you know, you are Asian and uh, a trans woman where it's like, it, it shouldn't matter that, you know, where we have, you know, different, uh, you know, traits, it should just, it, we should just be able to, you know, talk and relate as human beings.
And if we contextualise this in Australian society, um, let's talk about racism in Australian society. So, yes, once upon a time, Australia had a white Australia policy um, and um, for good reasons, we uh, moved on from that in the 70s. But what replaced, what sh in my view should have happened was the abolition of the white Australia policy, that's it. Um, you know, it, it, you know that would that sent the message that, um, as you're saying, it doesn't matter if I'm ethnically Asian, or you know if um, you know it doesn't matter what people's ethnicity and uh, ethnicities and races are. Um, we're all Australians, but of course, what replaced the white Australia policy was multiculturalism, and the angle with um, the angle of immigration policy to go with it was it wasn't just merely multiracial, multi-ethnic uh, immigration. It was on top of that um, multicultural, multicultural immigration to complement the multiculturalism policy that we still have. So my view, um, the problems, the, the racism problems for the most part should have gone away after the abolition of the white Australia policy. No, we had the introduction of multiculturalism as a government policy, and in my view, that laid the foundations for cultural Marxism from a racism point of view in Australia. Uh, one thing because it's multiculturalism, it's the floodgates for um, a cultural version of Marxism. Uh, one, one thing I've definitely noticed is, like, yes, there there was, you know, bigotry at the past, but the great thing about, you know, our society is we overcame it, but for the left and the cultural Marxism, uh, it's it's never enough. You know, there's always got to be, you know, more, uh, you know, policies. Like, if you just look at um, uh, yeah, Indigenous policy, I mean, it's, you know, uh, giving them all this, you know, extra, you know, welfare and affirmative action, it, it's never enough. Then there was the proposal for constitutional recognition. Suddenly that wasn't enough and they wanted a indigenous advisory body to parliament it just it just keeps getting like that's just one example the demands just keep getting more and more and more extreme and therefore you know we've actually you know violated the the principle of equality before the law and the the flow and effect from this is the effect on uh free speech and free association because it really rather than bringing people together it actually encourages you to be suspicious of people with differences like you know i like for example like i might not want to associate with you because i you know don't want to you know say something you know that could be interpreted as you know transphobic and if you and you go to the Human Rights Commission. And it's a shame that we've come to this. Um, I, you know, in everyday life, I, um, when I see strangers, when I'm out and about in the streets, um, the last thing that's on my mind is, um, you know, she's a woman, he's a man, um, that person over there is gay, um, you know, he's Aboriginal. Um, I mean, it's cultural Marxism, so we'll keep it in Australian context, cultural Marxism, it's quite distracting because um, what are the real, you go, you go to anyone on the streets, some, if strangers on the streets, you ask them, what is it, what really matters to them in their everyday lives, um, socially and politically, and, you know, they'll mention real world issues such as electricity prices, which is, uh, thanks to our obsession with renewals, we have one of the highest electricity, electricity prices in the world. Um, you know, people people being able to um, hold down their jobs, um, being able to feed their families, pay off the mortgage, um, you know, get their kids um, a good education. And I, I, I'm confident you go to a whole bunch of strangers in the street and that's what they'll tell you. Um, yeah. Unless, of course, um, for the, you know, if you get in contact with the um, minority of cultural Marxists, who, um, without probably not mentioning much of that, it's been about um, on an apparent ongoing racism and sexism and homophobia and transphobia. Like none of those things have died down in the last decade or two decades or three decades, which they have. Um, 
you just have to look how well Australia is doing from a equality of opportunity point of view. Um, we're doing pretty well, um, and it's um, but, but the cultural uh, the cultural Marxist approach is if something's a non-issue, turn it into an issue to further our cause. The visibility of uh, transgender people uh, has uh, become uh, quite prominent uh, in Australia and in other Western nations, and uh, it's it's really uh, come to prominence in the debate over uh, safe schools, uh, same-sex marriage, and also uh, bathroom access. Now, I consider myself in the the middle of the transgender issue. Like, I don't share the, as it's called, you know, trans uh, panic that some conservatives uh, display, but I also, you know, don't uh, I don't buy the, uh, as I call it, trans mania, which is, you know, every, like, trans person uh, is a hero and, you know, needs to be uh, celebrated. And I also don't, you know, uh, don't, don't buy that, you know, there's uh, 76 non-binary uh, genders and that uh, uh, gender is fluid. I am... Um, so as I, I call myself a uh, trans traditionalist because, you know, contrary to what the media tells us, trans people have actually been around for, you know, the, the past 50 years. It's only now that the left has really, you know, uh, championed, you know, what they see as uh, uh, transgender issues. I mean, as a uh, trans woman, like, how do you see the, um, you know, uh, transgender movement, which, how, how do you think it's... Uh, which direction do you think it's going in? It's definitely the cultural Marxist uh, direction. And um, the term you used earlier, just then, I, I quite liked it. You described yourself as a trans, um, you described yourself as a trans traditionalist. I would also describe myself as a trans traditionalist. And from what I gathered from a quick overview, uh, overview of what that means as a trans tradition, a traditionalist as yourself, I think you're taking a very reasonable approach. I think anyone out there that's taking the trans traditionalist approach is being very reasonable. Of course, the left, the politically correct, uh, the political correctness brigade, the culture Marxists, um, they they want us to engage in what you've described as transmania, and it's a concern for me as a trans woman. Um, you know, um, back about. You go about um, up until uh, a decade or two ago. So up until the early and ninety two thousands, it was there was more of a focus on real issues that had real implications for trans people. So um, violence, um, real physical violence against trans people, just because of who they are, uh, because of who they are. Um, uh, refusal to um, uh, refusal of public health care providers to um, provide uh, you know quote unquote adequate uh, adequate care for trans people um, so a lot of that um, those safety issues um, you know discrimination you know being able to just get on with your job in the workplace and not being harassed over being transgender the Trans narrative used to be concerned with those real issues that had um, real and a lot of times tragic uh, consequences, if not um, managed in the best way possible. Of course, with the trans narrative, thanks to the cultural Marxists, because now they're writing it, it's degenerated to, um, as you you just mentioned, gender flu uh, fluidity. Um, in my view. Um, if you, and you can do a Google search for this. In my view, um, there is a, a science, a biological science, a medical science to being gay, to being lesbian, to being bisexual, uh, to being intersex. There is a medical science to being transgender, or my preferred term is transsexual. Although the medical science behind that, at this stage, it's... Um, somewhat inconclusive, it's a bit shaky, um, but nevertheless, it's out there. But tr try to Google for, try to look up, try to do research on a medical science behind something other than LGBTI. So I suppose the stuff, the 
um, the letters that come after TI. Um, so you've touched on gen fluidity. There is no medical science. Um, there are only, you look at history and you look at the medical science, you look at the history of other civilizations and cultures, um, more or less, it's, there's only two, ever been two genders and there'll continue to be only two genders. These supposed other types of genders, they're more or less variations of um, genders, of um, gender express, uh, expressions. So different types of femininity, masculinity, um, you know, this is where you would use the term androgynous. So there's a spectrum, in my view, of gender expressions. So, you know, um, some, a, 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 a space, a quite varied space of gender expression. So um, some women like to only wear pants. Some men like to dress a bit more femininely. And um, there's all sorts of variations of gender expressions. You know, you go back to the Victorian era. In the Victorian era, pink was a boy's colour. And of course, that changed culturally over time. Um, but that's something that society was happy with. So, yeah, um, LGBTI um, used to be about um, issues that had safety implications and uh, other um, types of implications that, if not dealt with in the best way possible, could have real life um, quite and, you know, quite tragic consequences. Now we're heading towards a narrative that's about issues that don't have that gravity like they used to, like the other, like the issues that I just mentioned. Um, you know, if it's, it's, the consequences aren't as severe as can you hold down a job and just get on with the job and not be harassed? Um, can you um, pay for your, your own medical care and pay for it and be able to have access to it. Um, so, you know, it's it's still a problem in some sense. It's not a big problem like it used to be. So now the culture Marxists have to find other issues to fight on that don't have as, um, as you know, that gra doesn't have that gravity of seriousness. Now it's all, it, it trivializes, in a way it trivializes what used to be real issues that had um, tra potentially tragic consequences if not dealt with appropriately. I think the left were initially uh, threatened by um, the trans people because it disproved their belief that gender was a social construct, and that's why you had, uh, as uh, as they're called, you know, trans exclusionary radical uh, feminists who oppose uh, trans people because it you know, wrecked their narrative. And so now, obviously, they they you know they don't want to be seen as being mean to you know trans people, and that's why they've tried to you know merge. Uh, you know, trans issues with this uh, non-binary uh, gender uh, fluidity stuff, which I think is, uh, uh, you know, being, you know, a trans, it, it's the, the reason that you, you know, tran transition from one gender to the other is because, you know, you want to take on what are the, you know, uh, traditional, you know, roles of the, the opposite gender. Yes, so I... I mean, I would describe myself as someone that jumped from one side of the heteronormative binary. That's a very specific term. Um, and hetero, so heteronormative binary means um, uh, it means that you're one sex or the other, um, you're one gender or the other, um, you lean towards one set of gender expressions than the other, um, and um you're effectively straight so i jumped from one side of the binary hetero heteronormative binary to the other um and you know sexual from a sexuality point of view um we know that there's different types of sexualities and sexual orientations and i'm not too concerned because usually that involves uh consenting responsible adults over the age of 18 and um, uh, I, I'm not too, con you know, I'm not too concerned about it as long as, you know, there's consent and, you know, it's not being uh, forced down people's throats, then I'm pretty, 
I'm pretty cool with um, a, a few different types of um, sexual orientations out there. Um, and I, I'm a straight woman, yes, and I, I think that's neither here or there. So from a sexual, putting aside um, the recent same-sex marriage survey, which went way beyond being about sexuality, it, and we discussed this earlier, um, of course, What's the trendy thing to talk about now? Um, you know, for a while in recent times, it was about transgender people who, um, you know, we generally, it used to be transgender, transgender people for the most part had diagnosed real gender dysphoria, so to speak. And I use the word real in the sense of what we're now seeing in the medical profession, in the healthcare profession, is there's now two types of gender dysphoria. There is the traditional, so this is um, from a trans traditionalist point of view, the traditional early onset gender dysphoria, and I don't need to harp on about um, what the signs and symptoms of uh, what they are. We know what they are. You know, for me, growing up when I was four years old, I knew there was something different about me, and I could go on, but that's a quite common narrative. And now what we're seeing is what uh, what is being called rapid onset gender dysphoria. There is no medical science behind it um, at this point in time. And in my view, it's not real because you rapid onset gender dysphoria basically means you didn't grow up as a young child feeling that you were different identifying strongly with the opposite sex. Um, we see cases of rapid onset gender dysphoria where there are other um, social, there are other psychological issues happening in the background. And because we've normalised transgenderism, we've normalised transgenderism, we've demedicalised um, transgenderism, I'm concerned about the demedicalization of transgenderism, you know, um, there's currently a push. We went from gender identity disorder in the Australian, I think it's called the Australian Psychological Association's uh, DSM, so Diagnostic and Statistical, Statistical Manual. Um, version 4 used to call it, I think it's version 4, used to call it gender identity disorder. Then because it was somewhat offensive, version 5 is now calling, the current version is now calling it gender dysphoria which I don't have too much of a problem with, but there's, um, there's now a much bigger push to get gender dysphoria um, out of the, uh, the psychological, psychiatric um, Bible, so to speak. Um, so, you know, it's normalising transgenderism and, um, in my view, rapid onset, um, rapid onset gender dysphoria in a way, is a consequence of how we've normalised and we've demedicalised being transgender. And it trivialises what I went through growing up. Um, what I'm, you know, I still feel pain and grief as a trans woman because of my previous experiences and that, you know, transgenderism and being transgender is something I have to carry with me for the rest of my life. And now it's been trivialised thanks to the cultural Marxists. Uh, also, uh, a lot of opposition to the, or we'll call it the, the modern um, transgender movement comes from uh, conservatives, and a lot of a lot of their, their argument hinges on that you know it's not it's you know you can't simply um, you know change your you know actual biological uh, sex. It involves taking you know uh, bo uh, body altering uh, hormones, which in the case of male to female makes you um, you know in infertile. And they're especially concerned uh, about uh, children uh, transitioning because um, a lot of people don't consider children to be capable of making such life altering uh, decisions. Uh, uh, what's your response to the, the concerns that conservatives have about um, uh, tra uh, transgender uh, and trans transitioning. So I happen these uh, these days. I happen to agree with a lot of um, what conservatives have to say. In my view, the conservative views that are floating out there on 
trans issues, they're not transphobic. I mean, they might used to be, they, they might used to have a transphobic angle, but these days it's not transphobic. And I strongly believe that I've talked to um, social conservatives myself. It's, they're not into the business of transphobia. Maybe some of them, but for the most part, they're not in this day and age. And it's not even, I mean, maybe part of the reason is that they they feel that they need to walk on eggshells um, as a way to at least um, maintains, uh, uh, maintain a level of validity, validity of the concerns they're raising, but I still don't think it's transphobic. I mean, let's look at the conservative argument that, um, you know, you can't, um, trans people don't end up, when they transition, they don't end up changing sex. Well, it's a biological fact that you can't change um, chromosomes. I can't, uh, you know, I'm more than happy to admit that I'm a woman, I'm a trans woman, or I'm a woman that has XY chromosomes. I have no qualms about admitting that because that's the biological truth. I'm not, I'm not going to run away from the truth. Um, um, so they're 100% right on that. You can't change biological sex. In my case, I chose um, for my own sanity and for my own um, mental health to um, transition from one gender to the other, but biologically I'm still male. Um, in my view, that doesn't make me less of a woman, but I'm not going to deny biological reality. Um, and now can the concerns about, you know, how young is young Conservatives aren't too concerned these days about adults deciding to trans transition, you know. Okay, they may not necessarily agree with um, trans people deciding to transition as adults, but it comes back to the whole live and live, let live as long as you're not hurting anyone. So their conser social conservatives are taking that on board, um, which is pleasing to see. And I'm not concerned at all for their concerns about you know, how young is too young for trans children? Um, they've got some valid concerns. Um, there is no, the medical science, the research behind the current healthcare approach towards treating trans children, the direction it's he heading, the research that we have available out there, it's shaky. And I don't blame conservatives. I mean, I'm a conservative. This is why I'm a conservative now. I don't blame conservatives for being concerned because, as you know, as this is ticking along, and you know, we're still not sure of the long-term ramifications of, you know, treating um, these, you know, what is an explosion of trans children cases in the healthcare world. Um, whilst that's been happening. The cultural Marxists, the left, the politically correctness, political correctness brigade, they've been normalising transgenderism. So, is the normalisation of transgender, the normal, the normalisation of transgenderism, is that encouraging a culture, a, a new culture in Western society where, you know, gender dysphoria isn't treated medically and as seriously as it used to be. And there's anecdotal evidence to suggest that, um, you know, long gone the days that you walk into a psychiatrist, a psychologist, a psychiatrist's office, an endocrinologist's office, um, long gone the days where they would be the strong gate gatekeepers that make, you know, they do their jobs properly and make sure that um, you do indeed have um, early onset, in my view, real gender dysphoria. There's anecdotal evidence these days that, you know, it could just be a 30 minute appointment with um, the psychiatrist and then a 30 minute appointment with the endocrinologist. Yep, you it, it, more or less, if you say that you've got uh, got gender dysphoria, um, you know, after a bit of um, diagnostic testing verbally, um, yeah, that's it. You can start hormone replacement therapy. Um, and this isn't, you can Google this, there's anecdotal evidence for this, and it is a concern. So, and, and there are cases, there aren't too many, but there are cases of adults who decide, who think that gender transition is for them, they transition and they realise, oops, that's not for me. 
if there are adults, there aren't a, there aren't a big number of them, there are a small number, if there are adults that can make that mistake, then I don't accept the excuse that, oh, you know, the, uh, by that, you know, sure, we'll have some trans children um, who transition much, you know, way too early and then end up regretting it. Oh, you know, I get the vibe that it's a small, a small price to pay approach that I'm hearing from um, the left, the cultural Marxists. You know, one life ruined is too many lives in my view. So if we're, in my view, if we're going to treat transgender children medically for um, their gender dysphoria, um, I'd like to think that those children have, you know, real gender dysphoria where they show very extreme signs and symptoms that, you know, they need to be treated otherwise. You know, there's, there are some stories of trans children doing extreme things such as getting mum's nail clippers and, you know, trying to cut off their penis. Um, you can Google that as well. You know, that's pretty extreme and that needs to be looked at medically and treated very seriously. But it just seems like the approach um, for some parents and for some medical pre professionals these days is, oh, you know, it's, it's almost like it's treated like it's a trend, it's a fad. Well, I'm sorry, that trivialises the, the pain and grief that I went through early in life, the pain and grief that I, I'm still going through, the pain of grief that people who've experienced very extreme, very um, hurtful, you know, internally hurtful gender dysphoria, um, this isn't trivial, but apparently it is these days. Your name is Libby Down Under. Now, Libby is short for libertarian. We've uh, spoken mainly today about uh, social and um, cultural issues, but uh, libertarianism is uh, mainly about the, the size and role of government. So uh, with that in mind, I'd like to get your opinion on what you think that, you know, uh, the role of government should be with regard to, you know, tax spending, welfare, health and education. So I, Libby and Liberty is also a uh, female name. So that's the other reason why I uh, took that uh, name on on social media. So again, I describe myself as a conservative uh, libertarian. Uh, would I describe myself as a pure libertarian? I don't think I could describe that. Um, libertarian principles are important, um, but it's not the be or an end all. Um, I'd like to apply libertarian principles to my politics, but again, libertarian principles is not the be or an end or, and I suppose that doesn't make me a pure libertarian. So, um, on economics, so uh, on taxation, I would, so taxation in Australia, federally, I would very much prefer that, and I've written a, an article on this for Liberty Works. I would like to see, in the ideal world, all federal tax replaced with one income, one flat income tax. So let's say that's 25%, 25% across the board for everyone's personal tax liability and corporate tax liability. Um, you know, one flat tax rate, um, which means um, a much smaller Australian tax office because, um, you know, it's too big um, and I believe we have federal tax legislation I think it's it's either 11,000 pages or 14,000 pages it's one of those two you know back in the 50s I think it used to be a thousand pages or um, uh, something less than that now it's 11 or 14 it's um, thousands of pages um, and what value does that add to the economy not very much so um, you know, it's very ideal to argue for a flat tax, but in my view, that's the best way to go. Um, it's not just good for businesses, it's good for individuals. Uh, I mean, I I get a bit uncomfortable with saying taxation is theft. Um, so, you know, whilst there's the saying that taxation is theft and there's merit to making that argument, I would also make the argument that 
taxation is what makes civilization. So how do you reconcile the two? Well, in my view, a flat tax is the way to do it. And of course, it's not just tax that's a concern, it's also the welfare state. Um, if I, again, I'm being an idealist, but I, I tend to be supportive, at least in principle, of the idea of a negative income tax. So, um, uh, you know, you, I mean, my version of, of a negative income tax or NIT would be um, only people who are earning below or aren't earning, so earning below the tax-free threshold or not earning anything um, to cut out the red tape, all that waste of administrative costs that comes out of Centrelink, um, if all that can be um, cut out to replace with, okay, if you're earning below the tax-free threshold or um, you're not un 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 unable to earn, you're not earning anything at all, you know, a, uh, a one type of payment where, um, you know, it's, you're paid enough so that you can supplement your income or your lack of income so that you've got barely enough not to end up homeless or um, end up with chronic um, medical conditions, for example. Um, so I, I would be, I'm supportive of a NIT, but I'm very cautious about my support for that. Is there an easy answer for how we uh, do away with the welfare state so that, you know, everyone's self-reliant um, and you know, it, you know, the job of um, taking off, taking care of the less fortunate, the less well off, you know, that going back to tra charities because that's what charity charities used to fulfil the functions of welfare state. Then the government decided, oh no, we're filling that role. So can we go back to the, those times? I'm trying to be realistic here. Probably not. Something else that I've argued is, and it's a bit anti-libertarian for me to argue this, but um, expanding our current compulsory superannuation system to not just encompass um, retirement benefits, but, you know, in the event that, you know, um, education savings, um, you know, saving to be able to go to uni instead of having uh, the HEX um, system we currently have. Um, Singapore, Singapore has a, a medical savings account system that they currently run. It's kind of like the super version, superannuation version of, um, sorry, a medical version of superannuation. And that works well in Singapore. Um, disability, so, you know, forms of disability insurance, unemployment insurance. Um, if we really need to, I'd like to see the welfare state being scaled back in a way that super can be expanded to encompass those areas that encourages people to be self-reliant. It's not ideal. Um, it, you know, again, can we go back to the good old days where charities did um, the welfare state's job really well at much less cost? Can we go back to those days? No, but I think as libertarians, we need to be more realistic and creative on this um, front in a way that works for everyone. Uh, the tax and welfare bill, it's, it's certainly a, a big problem in Australia and certainly one that's got lost recently, but also another big problem is the, the nanny state in Australia. For example, we have high taxes on uh, alcohol and tobacco and there's all, uh, obviously in uh, Sydney they have the lockout laws which regulate you know, where you can go uh, you know, uh, at night. And, uh, is, is that something that, that you're concerned about as well and would like to see scaled back? I, yeah, look, as a general rule, um, if, if the government's involved and they don't need to be involved because consenting adults consenting responsible adults are involved and no one's getting hurt why be involved um for the most part the um uh, uh sydney folks who uh, like to go to uh, the pub have a good time um in a civilized manner not engaging in unlawful illegal and disruptive conduct um they're being punished under sydney lockouts and what has Sydney lockouts done for crime in Sydney? Not much, not much at all. 
So I'm very much, and, and look, so there's that, and then there's also illicit drugs. I don't, I'm not a fan of illicit drugs. Um, I, I don't think I would ever want to try illicit drugs. Um, but should I, you know, do I want government stopping people from, um, you know, touching, again, responsible, consenting adults touching illicit drugs? Well, I think the, you know, currently the war on drugs has created a, a black market for drugs that continues to expand the bigger the world of drugs gets. And um, who wins in the end? It's the drug dealers. Can we catch the drug dealer? Uh, excuse me. Can we um, catch the drug dealers? Well, we haven't been great at but law enforcement hasn't been in here in other countries. They haven't been great at catching the drug dealers. They're still out there. But if you want to cut off the drug dealers, um, then I, I would support, in principle, legalizing illicit drugs so that, um, you know, if people really need to touch illicit drugs, if it's, you know, if they do it in a regulated environment, it's like, um, I mean, if we say, for example, we made paracetamol, Panadol, um, illegal, um, there will certainly be a black market for it, and they certainly won't be regulated, clean, um, uh, less severe. There will certainly be, um, but more turn into a more life threatening type of medication type of drug. Um, so that's my position on drugs as well. Um, not a fan of drugs, but we, you know, we need to be realistic, and the government needs to take a realistic approach on how we tackle the drug issue. The world of drugs clearly isn't working. Well, Libby, I've appreciated your uh, unique insights on uh, these issues, and I'll, of course, uh, leave links to your online presence in the show notes page. So thank you for uh, giving us your time today. No, no worries. It's been a pleasure to be on here. And we'll definitely keep in touch. All right, everybody, that's the show for today. We've got a few special events lined up, which I hope to announce in the next few days, so stay tuned for those. Thanks once again for your company, and we'll see you next time. Thanks for tuning in to The Unshackled Waves. Please visit theunshackledwaves.net for all the ways to subscribe and follow the show. Don't forget to pick up your free ebook at theunshackledbattlefield.net. And keep checking out theunshackled.net for all the latest news and commentary.